I'm Ron Edwards with ChineseEconomicHistory.com, and here we're here today at the World Economic History Congress, uh, being held in Kyoto. This is a auspicious, auspicious occasion in that this is the first time that the World Economic History Congress is being held in the Far East. It's been tr traditionally held in the United States and, and Europe and, and other places. Uh, but it's, it's particularly exciting for Chinese economic historians. And so t today we're having a series of interviews with prominent economic historians. And we're honored today to have Professor uh, Thomas Roski, who uh, his PhD is from uh, Harvard. And he is a professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh. And we also have Evelyn Roski, who also received her uh, PhD from Harvard and uh, is Professor Emeritus of uh, History at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Professor Roski is known mainly for uh, long-run studies of Chinese economic performance, and uh, Evelyn Roski is uh, known for late imperial China studies. In particular, uh, Thomas, uh, Professor Thomas Roski is known for, uh, among other things, uh, a book he co-edited and also contributed to China's Great Economic Transformation, published by uh, Cambridge University Press, and also China's Rise and Balance of Influence in Asia, uh, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Uh, Evelyn Roski wrote a book early on that was quite influential uh, called Agricultural Change and the Peasant Economy in South uh, Asia. Uh, South China. South China, I'm sorry. Uh, and that was, that was published by Harvard University Press. So today I'd just like to simply start off with a asking both of you uh, how you got interested in Chinese economic history. Well, I started out as a physics major um, and then uh, became an economics major very quickly. And so uh, at that point I, I became interested in China because I became interested in learning Chinese. And one thing led to another. <laughs> I see. And Tom? I became interested in China when I was perhaps 11 or 12 years old. My grandparents in Australia sent me books. Uh, one was about China, one was about India. Uh, then uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was wanting to study both Chinese history and Latin American history, even though I too started as a physics major, but that didn't last too long. I switched to mathematics and then to economics. Uh, and then I became sick. I had to cut down my course load. And for some reason, I cut out Latin American rather than Chinese history. So <laughs> uh, I started Chinese history. Uh, I studied with uh, Knight Biggerstaff, who was the modern China historian at Cornell University uh, at that time. Uh, and then I uh, enrolled in his seminar on modernization of China. And I became interested in the commercial activity in Chinese treaty ports in the 19th century. I was And where was this at? This was at Cornell. Okay. I was an undergraduate. Uh, and I was fascinated by the treaty port literature, even with very, very limited Chinese at that time. Mm. I could read vast quantities of materials. There were newspapers. There were uh, trade statistics I could work with. Uh, and I was also interested in the Chinese hyperinflation of the 1940s. So I was aiming to write two papers, uh, but I was just consumed by the treaty port topic, and I eventually dropped the inflation uh, topic because there was, simply wasn't uh, uh, time to do this. So when I began graduate school, uh, I was actually interested in historical subjects, and then I gradually changed my focus to contemporary China. And so my, my dissertation was about uh, the economy of the People's Republic of China, but there was a historical uh, chapter. Uh, and from then on, I guess I was following the example of my mentor and also Evelyn's, uh, Dwight Perkins, who, who essentially divided his time between uh, contemporary studies and historical uh, uh, studies. So I, I've bounced back and forth uh, ever since. I see. And right now I'm in somewhat of a historical phase. <laughs> So Dwight Perkins was both of your advisors in graduate school, or well, you worked with him? 
He was a, a supplementary advisor for me because my first advisor was a historian, Yang Lianchang. Um, um, and, uh, but of course, Professor Yang could not evaluate the economic analysis, and so um, I had Dwight on my committee. I see. And Dwight also introduced mm -hmm. us, actually. Right. I see. Let's not yeah. go into that. <laughs> 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 okay, mum's the word on that. <laughs> that's fine. Well, thank you very much for that uh, that information. That's a, that's quite interesting to find out how many uh, Chinese economic historians eventually found their way into this this field. It's not uh, it's type of uh, quite a rare, rare uh, subfield within the, the the economics and the history profession, but a bit less so. Um, so uh, let me first ask uh, Professor Tom Roski, uh, in your books, uh, China's Great Economic Transformation, for which you uh, contributed and also were a co-editor, and also China's uh, Rise and Balance of Influence in Asia, uh, in the same way you contributed and were a co-author. Uh, in, in these, these two books, can you tell us a little bit about your, your contributions uh, in in uh, what you wrote and also the book in general? Well, the, the Great Economic Transformation volume was an effort to essentially summarize what happened during the first several decades of the Chinese economic reforms that began in the late uh, 1970s. So what we were trying to do was to put China specialists together with generalists, uh, so for example, uh, I together with my co-editor Lauren Brandt uh, wrote a chapter on industrial development, and we wrote that with John Sutton, who is an industrial organization specialist at London School of Economics. Uh, and, and our idea in forming these groups was to bring in the subject specialists to keep the work focused on the broad issues and avoid getting bogged down in the minutiae of Chinese statistics and uh, Chinese fluctuations. Uh, and so on. And this this was I think I think this was pretty successful. It took us eight years to put this wow. uh, volume together. Uh, the group got together twice. We lost a year because of the SARS epidemic in China in 2003. So no, but nobody could go and do any sort of uh, uh, field work. Uh, and, and I think that that volume uh, has held up pretty well. It's now seven years since the volume came out, probably about 10 years since most of the research uh, is finished, uh, some, somebody should, uh, uh, should update uh, this. <laughs> and and, and, and I mean now, from today's perspective, it's possible to take a longer run view of what's been going on uh, since 1978. Uh, but um, um, my thought is that nobody will be foolish enough to take on this job for quite a while, uh, so that book may stand up uh, for a few few years uh, yet. I see. Um, and uh, for, for Evelyn, uh, could you please explain uh, to our audience a bit about the, your book, Agricultural Change in the Peasant Economy of South China? Well, I. I began the book because I was interested in seeing how much economic data one could get from a very common kind of primary source, local gazetteers. And so um, that, that was what really led me to the subject. And then I became interested in the impact and whether one could say something more specific and precise about the impact of the foreign trade that uh, emerged along the southeast China coast in the 16th century. Um, and, um, and I found that one could say something about that, uh, uh, both in terms of the impact on the local uh, society, uh, meaning uh, examination degree success. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, it was really an exercise in, in looking at the development of foreign trade markets and the, the uh, commodities that fed into that market, and then turning around and then looking at the examination degree records uh, the, before the foreign trade really developed, and then after, and looking at the process. I see. 
And are uh, for both of you, are, the, are there any other publications that you're particularly interested in or uh, uh, felt that were quite influential or your, your favorites other than, other, other than these? Papers or books or anything in particular? Well, I guess I, I would mention two things. One, I wrote a book about economic growth in pre-war China, which mm -hmm. is about the early decades of the, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, my idea in doing this was to get away from uh, trying to put together numbers, which I had been doing for a long time and studying uh, the People's Republic. And ironically, it turned out that that's exactly what I ended up doing. Uh, trying to hmm. compile time series of industrial output, agricultural output, national income, per capita income, uh, and, and uh, so on. So I uh, spent a lot of time doing that, and I think it's had a certain amount of uh, uh, impact. And, and perhaps I could say something about what I'm involved in now, uh, that uh, I've been working with uh, two colleagues, Lauren Brandt at the University of Toronto, and Debin Ma, who's at the London School of Economics. Uh, and we're trying to uh, think about China's uh, economic performance over the long term. And I think what, what started us thinking about this is you have this enormous economic boom occurring in China in the last several decades. Uh, and at the same time, the historical literature is to a certain extent preoccupied with China as a case of economic failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same place. So there's got to be a narrative that links what happened in the 19th and early 20th century, or what didn't happen in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, with what happened uh, later on in the uh, 20th century. And that, that th there is no such link uh, uh, now. And, and, and so we're trying to uh, develop a framework for looking at the economy that allows us to explain or try to explain both the 19th century outcomes and the early 20th century outcomes and the big boom. I see. So the first result of this project is a review essay that we published last year in the Journal of Economic Literature uh, and, and we are uh, trying to extend this. Again, we're slow. Uh, we began the review essay in 2007. It was published in 2014. I see. Uh, but we hope, uh, in fact, we were joking this morning, will we be ready for the next World Economic History Congress uh, in three years? And uh, I, I've given up uh, announcing deadlines. Uh, so I, I hope uh, we will be ready for the World Economic History Congress uh, in three years, but uh, uh, make no promises. Well, I think that um, perhaps the most relevant for economic historians is my work on popular literacy, uh, which looked at you know, ordinary people whose literacy would not count in official records in terms of it's not advanced literacy, but who know enough to keep accounts or to um, function in, in farm markets and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, that was a, a study that looked at the kinds of opportunities that existed, the primers that existed for um, um, people to learn how to read at a very, uh, under you know, maybe a thousand characters, at 500 characters, something like that. This is actually for long before the 20th century. Hmm. So um, that was my, and recently I've strayed a great deal uh, from economic history. I've, um, and my most recent um, project has been, I've just published a book on early modern China and Northeast Asia, where I look at, in part, at the impact of, the, of European markets uh, on Asian shores and the domestic impact in China, Japan, Korea uh, in the late uh, 16th and early 17th centuries. I see. So you've both begun to look at uh, a bit longer periods of time span. Um, so let me, uh, I'd like to ask you, because this is one of the, the themes of uh, ChinaEconomicHistory.com, uh, and our target is basically economists in the West. Um, for most economists in the West, you're taught from day one that the world and and uh, virtually every country uh, makes a transition from a Malthusian trap to modern economic growth. The only issues being is uh, when and how. Uh, 
and uh, I'd just like to ask you, do you think China fits this, fits this traditional economic uh, view of the world? Perhaps not terribly well. Uh, I think uh, uh, looking at the long term, it's a bit hard to see the Malthusian trap uh, because we don't see much evidence of diminishing returns. Uh, it seems that uh, as population increased and as population density uh, increased, and here I'm thinking about the work by Dwight Perkins on Chinese agriculture from 1368 to 1968, uh, what seems to happen is that the labor force uh, can apply itself in part to building agricultural infrastructure, improving the quality of the land, improving irrigation, and so on, with the result that uh, there is, at least in, in Perkins' work, no sign of a long-term decline in uh, per capita supply of food, mm -hmm. uh, which is the essence of the Malthusian uh, argument. Now, we've just come from a session at this Congress uh, where the new work uh, reporting uh, findings of declining levels of per capita income in China uh, during the Ming Qing period, that is, for say, roughly from uh, uh, 1500 to, 2000, uh, to, to 1900. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical about the uh, uh, the uh, decline. Uh, the, the these uh, findings. I mean, we have to look at we have to look at at uh, the underlying database. Uh, I'm concerned that there, there seems to be a sort of race for long-term uh, quantification uh, in the China field going on just now. At this Congress, there are at least three or four papers that are offering new measures of long-term economic trends. Uh, I've been joking that I'm waiting for the quarterly data uh, to come out for the, uh, for the 18th uh, uh, 18th century, but uh, someone uh, was saying to me this morning that uh, 25 years ago, uh, when the Dutch historians started producing national income indicators going back a long time for, uh, the, for the Netherlands, uh, the data were very bad and the results were not impressive. But they've been working at it for a quarter of a century, uh, and this gentleman said now the best data are for the Netherlands and for England. That is historical. Uh, time series data, and, and, and this gentleman was saying that, that I shouldn't be too quick uh, to criticize these new studies because we may well be uh, at the start of a new era of quantification of long-term trends in China and that 10 or 20 years from now uh, we may have very good data. And I, and I think that's a, f that's a fair comment because now people are discovering all kinds of new information, so people are finding merchant account books. Uh, with information about wages, about prices, about the exchange between copper and silver uh, currency, uh, and and uh, so on. So I think I think this is uh, uh, there's a lot of ferment in, in the field right now, which is which is very promising, uh, and it's part of a it's really part of globalization. Uh, we're looking at globalization of economic history studies, and that people are turning to. Uh, both China and Japan, also India and Indonesia, uh, and trying to replicate the sort of studies that are uh, available for England, for France, uh, for Holland, for Turkey, uh, and, and of course uh, for North America and, and Russia as well. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's a good time to be thinking of uh, economic history. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so I think that um, James Lee and his uh, collaborators, their studies on, on demographic history, you know, suggest um, birth, uh, some degree of spacing of births, uh, which of course would be uh, important for thinking about uh, the Malthusian trap. And uh, also, of course, the evidence of uh, infanticide, uh, which, I mean, I know it's often treated as, well, it's a last resort, you know, it's people are really pressed for, for resources, but can also be seen, I mean, if we remove the moral element as a decision made, you know, economically rational decision, I think. And um, so I, I don't, I think that one has to do more, there has to be more research done before we can really decide what the contours of the pressures 
on the economy were from the demographic side. But relative to the West, do you think it was, it was can we say enough, do we know enough to say it, it, was, it was at least a bit different? It was certainly a bit different. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the thing about spinsters in Western Europe, okay, so they're voluntary celibacy, if you want to call it that, you know, so they remove a certain number of fertile women from the giving birth. But on the other hand, when we think that maybe 15% of males in China were too poor to marry, I mean, that's also removing sure. people from potential fatherhood. And Just going back to the second portion of your question, it's absolutely the case that China uh, has embarked on a process of modern economic growth. Uh, and we see this uh, beginning in the early decades of the 20th century. So that uh, my conclusion uh, from my study of economic growth in pre-war China was that in the decades prior to the outbreak of the Pacific War, so essentially from 1910 to 1936, uh, there is an increase in output per capita, uh, and there's an increase in agricultural output per capita, uh, and there are increases in, in consumption uh, as well. In per capita terms, these are not large increases. The increases are very small uh, compared to what we've seen in China in the past several decades. But uh, there's there. little question in my mind that the, that the, a the averages are notably higher for both output and consumption uh, per capita uh, in the 1930s than they are 25 years earlier. I see. And uh, a final question that I just cannot resist asking because uh, I work on this is, is uh, China in the Song Dynasty. Now quantitative evidence is quite, quite shaky on this. Uh, we have no, pretty much no hope uh, that we can see on the horizon of constructing any type of national accounts in order to yeah. produce GDP estimates. But there are, there are indicators, but not only quantitative, but uh, there's a lot of qualitative uh, evidence in, say, for example, discoveries of uh, kiln sites and things like this, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, written accounts of the the popularization of tea amongst a bunch of new classes in, in China and so forth. So I wouldn't, I, I don't, I couldn't, I can't ask you um, your your view on GDP per capita in, in, the, in the Song Dynasty, but I, I'd like to ask you, uh, what's your impression of the economic uh, uh, performance of the Song Dynasty based on all the evidence that's that's available? That's a uh, that's first. a bit out of your field, <laughs> but you, as, as China experts, uh, that uh -huh. is fair game for a for a uh -huh. general audience. Uh -huh. and if you feel not, uh, uh -huh. you don't feel comfortable. Uh, well, um, of course, uh, I began life as a Ming historian. Okay. So I have a bias against, um, you know, because the, my question is if the Song was um, had all of the attributes that the Ming. Did yes. Uh, that's a question in my mind. Did it have you know all of the attributes? Because we do talk about commercialization, monetization, you know, urbanization, all of these as major trends in the Ming period. Yes. And so, if the Song was equally, you know, um, equally growing, growing. I mean, if these trends were were at the same level, yes. then what happened between the Song and the Ming? Mm -hmm. And I really think that to say that well the Mongol invasion occurred mm -hmm. and conquest is, is uh, not adequate yes. as an answer. So in my mind, it's still an open question. Okay. I, I don't have a research knowledge of this period, uh, but I think that uh, a number of specialists in this period have gone way too far in trying to put numbers on uh, qualitative changes. Uh, you say uh, there is no uh, sufficient evidence to construct uh, estimates of national product, but I have seen uh, that people have constructed estimates of national product and they, and they, don't, they don't make a lot of sense internally, yes. even without a deep research knowledge of the period, which uh, I don't have. Uh, and I'm pleased to see that some specialists in that period, such as yourself, are uh, skeptical of these 
uh, what I consider to be overenthusiastic claims about about uh, growth and output per capita, about uh, in industrialization, uh, and because I think these claims are based on uh, on speculative interpretation of very narrow uh, items of uh, evidence, uh, and actually I think some of the great greatest enthusiasts of Sung intensive growth are people who can't read Chinese. The, the people who are the Europeanists <laughs> who 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 I don't who, who 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 can't possibly right. uh, interpret uh, uh, the evidence. But I fear that some of our sinological colleagues have uh, have egged, egged them on uh, by producing uh, high but dubious estimates, estimates. For example, of iron production. Sure. Uh, for the uh, Sung period. Yeah, my, my own view is actually if there's going to be a case that's going to be made for uh, per capita growth in, in Song China, it's not going to rely heavily on quantitative data. The, mm -hmm. the iron output uh, data, Wagner's shown that uh, we can't say anything definitively because the sources, the basic sources, we don't know if they overlap and uh, there's also a 10% assumption of tax which has been questioned and so on. Uh, but uh, my experience has also been that, that the uh, qualitative evidence has been uh, relatively overwhelming in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, uh, and that's, yet to, that's yet to be documented, but that's actually yeah. my, my, my current work. So, um, yeah. If, if we're, if we're anyway. going to talk about per capita, we need to know how many people. And sure. for the Song period, we don't. There are figures on number of households, mm. uh, and there are wildly varying figures on household size. So uh, this, this, is, this is a very basic uh, issue. And people come and say, well, I think that household size is this. Yes. But what of other people who say that's this or that? And then population uh, and, and, changes. And, and uh, so uh, there, there's just, um, uh, there is a tendency to, for excessive quantification. Uh, I have seen an account of the Sung Dynasty where they, t they talk about how much of the grain goes to producing liquor mm. on a year-by-year -year basis <laughs> with many decimal points. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, it's impossible. You, you, could not, you could not make that calculation for any period of 20th or 21st century sure. China. How, how can we do, do it, it for a thousand years? Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah, the, quanti the, the quantitative evidence is, defi is definitely uh, uh, rough indicators at best. It's very rough indicators at best. But uh, yeah, I think the, the, uh, those together with qualitative evidence ha have, ha have a chance, but that's yet to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there's good reason for, for skepticism, but there's also uh, uh, the doors open also for hope, uh, at least from uh, from my side, mm -hmm. uh, but that's that's a that's a whole uh, a whole agenda of work for another group of people. Yeah, and I do agree that the uh, the the numbers are, you just you, the best numbers you can put out are rough guesstimates, and we don't know what's behind a lot of them and things. Mm -hmm. And I think the quantitative evidence, uh, and you give it back to a thousand years ago, you just can't. You just can't swallow it. I mean, look at the debates going on uh, right now about hedonic pricing and on, on, the, on these things. There are debates. Uh, those are debates about data 10, 20 years ago, and they're screaming and yelling. And a thousand years ago, <laughs> some of them, no, no, no hope. Just to be honest and say they're indicators. Yeah, that's, I think that's uh, that's definitely true. But anyway, enough uh, enough about that. Uh, and we hope you enjoy your. Uh, your time here at the uh, World Economic History Congress at, at Kyoto, and thank you very much for uh, having us uh, having an interview with us. Thank, thank you, you for the invitation. Much. Mm -hmm. Professor Thomas Roski is known for, uh, among other things. Uh, a book he co-edited and also contributed to China's Great Economic Transformation 
published by uh, Cambridge University Press, and also China's Rise and Balance of Influence in Asia, uh, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Uh, Evelyn Roski wrote a book early on that was quite influential uh, called Agricultural Change and the Peasant Economy in South uh, Asia. South uh, China. South China, I'm sorry. Uh, and that was, that was uh, Harvard and he is a professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh. And we also have Evelyn Roski, who also received her uh, PhD from Harvard and uh, is Professor Emeritus of uh, History at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, professor Roski is known mainly for uh, long-run studies of Chinese economic performance and uh, Evelyn Roski is uh, known for late imperial China studies. In particular, uh, Thomas uh, published by Harvard University Press. So today I'd just like to simply start off with a asking both of you uh, how you got interested in Chinese economic history. Well, I started out as a physics major um, and then uh, became an economics major very quickly. And so uh, at that point, I, I became interested in China because I became interested in learning Chinese. And one thing led to another. <laughs> I see. And uh, Tom? Hello, I'm Ron Edwards with ChineseEconomicHistory.com and here, we're here today at the World Economic History Congress uh, being held in Kyoto. This is a auspicious, auspicious occasion in that this is the first time that the World Economic History Congress is being held in the Far East. It's been tr traditionally held in the United States and, and Europe and, and other places. Uh, but it's, pretty, it's particularly exciting for Chinese economic historians. And so t today we're having a series of interviews with prominent economic historians. And we're honored today to have Professor uh, Thomas Roski, who uh, his PhD is from 